Bless the Lord. Okay. If he's been good to you, just go ahead and pray. Sometimes you just got to get it out. You can't hold your peace. It's good to be here in the presence of the Almighty God and God's people and God's Spirit. I thank you for this opportunity to share with you what God has given me. And I thank this pulpit ministry who has been so warm and so kind and has welcomed me here. And to all of the officers and members of this great church. And I'm glad to see Minister Freeman, Reverend Freeman is what I call her because I served as her assistant for many years. And during that time, we got to see ministry up close and personal, as the young peoples would say, with no filters. They were just regular people with regular needs and we ministered to their needs. So I thank God for her. I'm just glad to be in the house of God. And I thank you, uh, Reverend, for that introduction that I was beginning to wonder who it was that she was introducing. I didn't recognize that person, but I'm just a country boy from Selma, Alabama, and all that other stuff you can forget about. <laughs> but thank you so much for such a warm uh, introduction. And thank this choir for such a wonderful job. Let's give them a hand. And these musicians, thank you for doing just a marvelous job. Now, when Deacon Mary Joseph uh, talked with me, she said, we don't stay long. We just go in and do what we got to do and get on out. So I'm going to try to stick to those rules. I'm going to do what I got to do and get on out of the way. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Verse 1 through 14, John chapter 1, starting at verse 1 through 14. <clears throat> I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> John chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being, what has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. This is the word now. He was in the world. And the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own. And his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him. Who believed in his name. He gave power to become children of God.
who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. And the word became flesh. And the word became flesh. You may be seated. <laughs> it would appear that the authors of the sacred text have a case of disassociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder when it comes to the condition of the flesh in scripture. On the one hand, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us, do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? While on the other hand, in chapter 15, it says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Then Job comes along and says, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God to behold him for myself and not another. Now listen to Paul as he tries to sort through this multiple personality disorder. Paul says, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but somebody else that's doing it. But sin that dwells within me, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Now I cannot attest to the mental state of the biblical writers, but what is apparent is that our flesh has the capacity to achieve the highest good to the glory of God, while also committing the worst of sins, even unto death. A Christian theologian once wrote, we human beings are a mystery to ourselves. We are rational and irrational, civilized and savage, capable of deep friendships and murderous hostility, free and in bondage, the pinnacle of creation and its greatest danger. Yet in all of our fleshly inconsistencies, God still loves us and sees something valuable in each of us. Hear the words of Psalm 8. What are human beings that thou art mindful of them? Mere mortals that you care for them. Yet you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Seeing that God has placed a stamp of approval on all humanity, no one is in a position to pass judgment on anyone based on our differences. We are all a gift from God, and every good and perfect gift comes from above. There are many divisions in the American culture today based on race, sexuality, ethnicity, social status, gender, and religious persuasion. These divisions are fueled by the idea that one race or ethnic group is superior to the other, none of which is more prominent than the history of oppression and discrimination against black people in America. The consequences of such divisions are a devalued and dehumanized people trapped in a cycle of hopelessness. Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas describes this hopelessness as such. In short, because of the violent anti-black narrative that helps to define Americans' identity, black bodies are trapped in a cycle of violence from poverty to incarceration to death. We've come a long way in the fight for social justice in this country, but we still have a long way to go in dismantling the systems of oppression that were designed to keep us trapped in a cycle of hopelessness. But in order to be effective in the fight, everyone has to know that their life matters. Everybody has to believe that their own life is worth living. When we don't believe our life has any value, we start to lose hope. 
And a people without hope is destined to be lost. But we can live a fulfilled life when we realize that God is the one who gives our life value. God is the one who makes us somebody. The author here in the text is writing to a very diverse and divided audience. The religious elites wanting to maintain the empire of temple worship were trying to suppress the rising status of Christianity. The hereditary Jewish Christians were constantly attacking the Hellenistic Christians by claiming because they were from Moses, our ancestral rights gave us superiority over others in the faith. And the Essenes and the Gnostics disputed over whose theology was correct. It was all just a big power grab. Each group wanting to control the others. Well, we still have some power struggles in the church today. Everybody wants to be in charge, but very few are interested in what the word of God says. The church, the church once used to be a place where everybody was somebody. No matter who you were or where you came from, everybody at church was somebody. After being beat up all week long, beat up on the job, beat up by the system, beat up by your problems, beat up by financial obligations, beat up by your disobedient children, beat up by your relationships, beat up by society. After being beat up all week long, when you got to church, we can lay it all at the altar of sacrifice. And everybody was on the same page. We weren't concerned about who was in charge. All we wanted to know was what did God have to say about our suffering. We came to church looking to get close to God. We wanted God to get close to us. We came to church looking for hope. But now we've achieved a relative degree of success. We have big government jobs now. And we make a little more money. And now the church is caught up in money, yeah. power, and politics. The only way a person can feel important in today's church is if you pay the right amount of money, have the right degrees, and maintain the right connections. And God is not pleased. I can hear the author of the book of Romans says, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so the writer here, breaking with the tradition of the synoptic, this fourth gospel delivers a radical restatement of early Christianity. In the first statement alone, you can hear a prophetic voice of the writer calling for a more inclusive religion. Verse one says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now this is a very loose translation of the opening phrase, preacher. In the beginning, in the original Greek, there is no article before the word beginning. So really a better translation would be in beginning or in a beginning, which means that this beginning in the Gospel of John could be older than the beginning we have in Genesis. What the author was essentially trying to say is that God is bigger than one location and one point of time. He's bigger than any one religious persuasion or any one political group or any one idea. God is a big God. He's all over the place. Starting beginnings is all over the place. So wherever your beginning began, just know God was already there. I don't know where your beginning was, but wherever it began. Sometimes we get in trouble in life 
Some of us have to start over again and again. And guess what? If you start over, he's there. If you have another beginning tomorrow, he was already there. Wherever your beginning begins, God is already there. For Isaiah, his beginning was in the year King Isaiah died. Jeremiah's beginning was before he was formed in his mother's womb. Paul or Saul's beginning was on a Damascus road. And for me, it was a, in a little church on the side of a road in Selma, Alabama. I don't know where your beginning was, but just know this, wherever you begin, God is already there. And having established that the word was in everyone's beginning. The writer announces that the same God created us all. Look at verse three, all things came into being through him and without him, not one thing came into being. Another translation says all things were created by him and by him, nothing was made that was made. At our most basic level of being, we are all equally created. Each of us has our own unique identity, the embodiment of our life's experiences, but our differences do not have to divide us. Rather, they can unite us because we all share the same creator. With all the noise surrounding the early church about who is a better Christian and whose heritage gave them advantage, the writer reminds the audience that God created everything and everybody. Therefore, no one has the right to assume a position of authority over another. Black or white, rich or poor, we all are made from the same stuff. Cut us and we all bleed the same red blood. Because we are all equally created, we are all connected. We are all brothers and sisters. Thus, we cannot keep silent when we see one group of people oppressed. We should all be concerned. The wall might be to keep immigrants out today. But that same wall could be to keep us out tomorrow. When we see young black and brown people locked up in prison unfairly for unnecessary lengths of time, those are not just somebody's children. Those are all our children. Violent shootings like the one in Virginia Beach the other week that don't just affect some families, but all of our families are impacted. We got people working two and three jobs, trying to make ends meet, and the system is constantly working against them, even trying to take away their health care. That should keep all of us awake at night, whether we have health care or not. We cannot get so comfortable in our own personal success that we are not concerned about the well-being of others. Dr. King says injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects everybody indirectly, because we are all connected by way of our creation. We're all God's children. Therefore, we cannot ignore the sufferings of others. Not only are we all equally created, but also we are all equally guilty. Look at verse 10 through 11. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. 
That's why we cannot afford to pass judgment on anyone because we are all equally guilty. Somebody didn't believe that. Look at your neighbor and say, you just as guilty as I am. We're all equally guilty. So no one is in a position to pass judgment on another. And no group of people is better at passing judgment than church folks. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about resurrection. Now I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about that little church I grew up in in Selma, Alabama. That's how they were. No one. No one is better at passing judgment than church folks. And one of the reasons that many people have stopped going to church, especially young people, is because they say we church folks are too judgmental. Not only are we judgmental, but we're hypocritical with it. We judge folks for doing some of the same stuff that we are either used to do are still doing secretly or we wish we could do it but we done did it so long till we just don't have the energy to do it anymore we haven't always lived so holy we haven't always lived so righteous we weren't born saved sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit. For the Bible said that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if God did not show up when God did, some of us don't know where we would be right now. Thank God for showing up when he did. I, I don't mind, I don't mind saying that I used to be in a world of sin. But Jesus came and he took me in. I don't mind saying that God showed up for me. I don't just believe in miracles. I am a miracle. God showed up, picked me up, cleaned me up, gave me a brand new start. I know I'm not the only one in here. I know I'm not the only one grateful that God showed up in my life. I wonder do I have any other grateful folk in here who are not ashamed to let the world know if God had not showed up in my life, I don't know where I would be. Come on, praise God for showing up. Will he show up? Won't he show up? Won't he show up? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom the Lord had redeemed from the hands of the enemy. God sent out an invitation to humanity through his son Jesus. Bidding us to come back to him. And we stamped the invitation return to sender. We rejected the light of God's love and chose the evil darkness. And as a result, we all have the capacity to sin. No one is without fault. We have rejected God and chosen to do things our way. He created the world. Everything was made by him, but the world refused to trust him. He was in the world, and yet the world did not know him. Even his own rejected him. Yes, we are all equally guilty. But I'm glad the story doesn't end there. The good news is that although we rejected God at first, we have an opportunity to get it right. Verse 12 through 13 says, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. 
We are all equally created. We are all equally guilty. But we all have an equal opportunity to get it right. God wants to be in relationship with us. And God's only requirement is that we believe. We can live a fulfilled life when we believe that God is the one who gives our life value. Jesus said in John 10 and 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. God has given us a chance to get it right. Whoever believes in Christ has access to God's power. A power that can make a difference in your own life and in the life of those around you. So God takes a risk right here. God gives us access to divine power, but we are still in the flesh, which means that there is still a potential for us to sin or abuse the power, even in our best efforts, with our best intentions we still might mess up. And so the question becomes, how do we live responsibly with this power? How do we walk in Christian authority without being inebriated by the intoxicating lure of worldly power? How do we become woke to the systemic racism and oppression that has been holding us back for so long and not be angry with the oppressor. Well, I can imagine God saying, I'm glad you asked those questions, preacher. And I can imagine him answering, and the word became flesh and lived among us. Jesus came to this world to demonstrate how we can live a liberated and abundant life right here, right now, in earth. The incarnation has happened in history and in community, but it also happened in us. And so the word not only became flesh, But the word is flesh because it still lives in you and me today. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven to live a victorious life. We can live victoriously right here, right now in the earth because God has given us power to live victoriously. For the Bible said to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave them power. We have more power in this room right now than they have in Congress and in the White House combined. Because the truth is, every two or four years, they risk losing their power if they lose their position. But the blood that gives us strength someday, today will never lose its power. God has given us access to a supernatural power, wonder working, healing power, way out of no way power, food on the table power, burden bearing power, pick you up when you're down power, give you joy when you're sad power. He didn't give us ordinary power, but it's a supernatural, divine power.
power that'll make you do right when you want to do wrong. Can I get a witness in here? Is there anybody here know about God's power? I'm glad I have his power. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for God's power. His power saved me. His power called me. His power took care of me. His power is holding me. I don't have a whole lot of money. I don't have a whole lot of connections. I don't have no political ties. But what I have is some divine, supernatural, and tell them that your life matters and their life will turn around not because of me but because God has given me power you got power you got power you got power you got power use your power to make a difference in this world use your power to turn this world to his power to everyone that believes he's given them power to become the children of God Jesus came to show us how we can live an abundant life and use God's power responsibly. And the word became flesh. And it lived among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory as of the Father's only Son. Full of grace and full of truth. Now I want folk who believe that they got power to stand up and give God some powerful praise. Not no ordinary, regular Sunday morning praise. But praise Him like you got power. Come on, praise Him like you got some power. Praise Him till the devil get mad. Praise Him till your situation turn around. Praise Him till your life start to look better. You may have pain when you got here, but praise Him till you start to feel a little loose in your body. Praise Him till your sadness turns to gladness. Come on, give Him a powerful praise. Let a powerful people praise a powerful God. Let a powerful people Praise a powerful God. Come on, don't stop now. Don't stop now. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. We got an election coming up. Come on, praise him. We need some power. Holy Ghost power. Wonder working power. Miracle working power. Healing power. Life changing power. Let the power of God resonate in your life. So the next time you face a challenge in your life, remember you have more than you think you have. You have access 
to some supernatural power that will enable you to do things you thought you could not do. Folk look at you and all they see is what's on the outside. And some of y'all look pretty good, so that might be good enough. But for me, I need a little more. <laughs> when they look at me and see what's on the outside, they think, oh, he's not much. Big old country boy, but boy, what they don't know is I got something working on the inside. <laughs> something that's greater than the world. <laughs> and it's giving me power. Aren't you glad you got power? Come on one more time, thank God for his power. Thank God for his power. And the word became flesh. Amen.